So Sophie, who is an anthropologist, um, currently focuses on household energy production and consumption, also in relation to culture and technology interrelations. Until 2015, she ran the anthropological part of an industrial project dedicated to energy management and solar production on French islands. Please welcome Sophie. Thanks. So can anthropology contribute to the, devel the development of solar energy? I'm sure that you know what the answer is. It's yes. But let's see together how we can come to that conclusion. My first field work as a young anthropologist took me to Cameroon in a little village called Afanesoke. I used to work on kinship, gender issues, uh, agriculture <coughs> activities and so on. And uh, some villagers used to gather uh, every week around a radio set to listen to a radio drama. It was about a man who'd left for France. Some villagers had never been to Yaoundé, which was a seven hour drive from the village. But yet they were fascinated by this man's stories and by things such as how to take the underground. So batteries for listening to the radio allowed them to maintain the link to the outside world. And these items were a real challenge to come by. 30 years later, now, I work for EDF. And last year, I went to Real and Island, which is a French department. I met a man who had put up some solar panels. He told me that he decided to become a PV, a solar producer, produce it so has to have electricity during power cuts and hurricane. So keeping related to his relative was no easy task. In France, we have a, an almost magic relationship with electricity. We speak of the electricity fairy. We can't imagine living without electricity, but we're in the dark about where it comes from. How do we use electricity? Is it used in the same way by everybody in every location? This is the kind of topics we work on at a company such as TDF, for industrial reasons, of course. So before going any further, I'm going to tell you a few words about EDF team. EDF has uh, an IND, which is not the case of all energy suppliers. We are about 2,000 researchers. And among these researchers, there are some economists and about 30 semiologists, sociologists, political scientists, and anthropologists. We work on fuel poverty, societal trends and the impact on energy demand, on uh, renewable energies and energy transitions. We build some academic partnerships, but most of the time, we're part of internal project together alongside with engineers. And this work with engineers is really fruitful. So we translate sometimes very technical or very commercial issues in more anthropological ones. So my job is to go e going out on the field, or part of my job is to going out on the field what engineers and commercials or policymakers don't do. So I visit local residents, whether they're EDF customers or not, and I work on buildings. On the left, we have a, a picture of a house. I took, in, uh, I took this picture in Corsica, uh, made of wood, and in Corsica, there's a lot of air conditioning uh, now air conditioning is spreading, which is a, a quite a big issue for EDF. On the right, you have appliances, electric appliances, in uh, Reading Island, uh, a place where many culture mixed. And how many culture mix? EDF needs some anthropologists to understand energy demand. So when we go out uh, on the field, we are struck by the discrepancy between how people are supposed to behave according to engineers and people practices. So among, uh, 
Uh, among the questions we work on, one giving sign into why local resident install, install solar panels become PV producers if they are already connected to the power grid. So I will use this example to talk about our input as anthropologists in the industry. So in this poster, which date back to the 70s, Solar energy appears in explicit opposition to nuclear, which does just back the oil shocks and ecological political parties are advocating for solar as an alternative to nuclear. Still to this day, we have an enchanted vision of PV installation by local residents, who are supposedly motivated by ecological concern concerns. Actually, local residents' motivation <laughs> are also driven by, driven by very practical concern. The anthropological insight helps to go further that positive public opinion poor about solar. In concrete terms, it's about going and visit local residents, um, running some interview, uh, having some observations, asking the why they decided to become PV producers what they're expecting from the, from the electricity they produce, and how they use it. So, a photovoltaic development at the local level is a small revolution in France. To give a big picture of the electric system, it's centralized, nuclear reliant, and the development of renewable energies is based on financial incentives. So, producers sell the electricity they produce to EDF at fixed rate, uh, at, at purchase price fixed by the state. And uh, these prices have an impact on people profiles, uh, people, prof um, pe people motivation for becoming PV producers, if, to be more, more precise. Uh, between 2006 and 2010, these prices were especially high, and many people decided to become PV producers as, if, as they were decided to invest in the stock uh, markets. Then prices dropped, and they were divided by two. So the decrease in purchasing price has introduced a greater diversity among people profile producer's profile with budding self-conception. We've moved from a mainly financial logic to a more domestic logic. So, who are the producers? One of our contributions to the industry on this topic is to show that not everybody becomes a PV producer, which is not that obvious for industrial or commercial teams. <laughs> um, so, it doesn't concern all social categories and ages to the same extent. Most of the producers I met since 2010 were first male, were between 45 and 50 years old, sometimes 80 years old, but most of them were 45 and 50 years old, owners of their house, and they decided to uh, install PV after paying the house for financial reason, of course, and sometime after some renovation. They were uh, worried for the bill and sensitive to the environmental, environmental issues. So becoming a PV producer, it's a, a, a way to manage uh, environmental concerns and uh, um, financial concerns. So, beyond this typical profile, our approach also reveals the diversity of being, acting, and thinking. There's no average behavior based on a strictly economic or technical rationality. We spoke about rationalities a few minutes ago, and it's clear that for suppliers and engineers, engineers who work in, what is not economical or technical, rational, is not rational at all. 
So, uh, our, uh, our role is to show that there are many kinds of rationalities. So, producers are also citizens, mothers and fathers, inhabitants of a region, they have jobs, they have hobbies, and all these different aspects help to build some anthropological categories. So, it's about going beyond industrial and co ca commercial categories by divide up customers according to their power contract or their status, business or individual customers. So, let's take the case of Claire. Claire's house is located in the southwest of France, in the Basque region. Claire owns a whole car, Dick's duck, ducks and uh, also a parrot. Claire is 58 years old, she's retired and disabled. A few years ago, she decided to install some PV for Total Cell to have an additional income when she would retire. Last year, when self-conception offers came out, she decided to buy equipment. In her opinion, uh, self-consumption would allow her to um, cut down her bill uh, when she would retire. But Claire doesn't know her bail amount. She only knows that if she buys equipment now, she'll be able to, to keep uh, consuming electricity despite the decrease in income and despite upcoming increase in electricity price. So people don't always perform cost effectiveness calculation. I'm sure that you, you know this. But that's not that obvious when uh, industrial try to develop some technical devices or offers. So people also think in terms of accessibility in order to maintain a certain comfort level despite uh, income decreases or upcoming increases in electricity prices, which means that we are really far from massive off-grid consumption. So, Claire doesn't own a storage battery. She tweaks her daily habits as much as she can to maximize her production consumption. We saw that now houses are smart, but that's not smart enough to, to to, to make all uh, of the electricity. So people have to act, have to manage their demand uh, by themselves. So she drives the apple from her garden, sends to the electricity she produces, and she stores the, uh, it, them for her power for winter time. So she has bought a bigger fryer to make the most of uh, electricity power and to welcome a family during, uh, winter, uh, during Sunday lunches. So the following is a quote from Claire during our interview. Since I've installed PV, I've booked electricity devices I didn't have before. Therefore, I won't cook fries in the evening. Instead, I do it around noon, when the weather's sunny. But during this interview, Claire confessed to me that, in fact, she uses a, a fryer during bad weather because she likes fries, so she's not going to stop eating fries because it, it's a bad weather. So with this type of purchase, there's a potential booster effect. All these issues tie into an anthropology of daily life and have consequences for industrial. So, uh, we could say that there's no average producer, as there's no average consumer. Uh, this is, there's um, categories of producers, and Claire was just an example we just looked at. So, I'm not going to develop. Um, the other case, it was just a case to explain uh, how, how we can work. Um, but of course, we multiply the different observations and different territories we work on to have a comparative uh, uh, approach. And um, at the end of this comparative approach, you, you can observe and conclude that all the producers we made uh, have a, a common search for 
energy autonomy. Autonomy from fossil and nuclear energies, from the grid, from the price of electricity, or even for power cuts. So the dream is a dream for a free available solar energy, which is not completely the case when you don't have a storage battery. Uh, a dream of uh, an energy uh, that allows you to maintain a certain level of comfort without harming the environment or your wallet. Um, so PV is not only useful, PV carries an ideal of energy autonomy. It has a playful dimension. Most of us followed the adventure of solar impulse you have on the left, which flew all over the world last year. And this playful dimension is an opportunity for industrial to develop some offers or structures, like the smart flower you have on the right, the panels are shaped like, pa uh, like a flower that turns toward the sun, so it associates solar energy uh, with nature. So in the case I studied, people dream of autonomy, but this autonomy is a fantasy. Most of the people I meet overestimate their production capacity or underestimate their conception maybe. So if I take the example of a project I participate in, out of 200 people uh, surveyed, three quarters of the participants thought that their production would cover half of their conception. In reality, solar covered three quarters of their conception. So, this search for autonomy is uh, found in various contexts. It's therefore central to the decision to become a PV, producers, a PV producer. But this search for autonomy is part of local context. It means that if you can make some generaliza generalization, it's very important to go and seek out and make some observation in local uh, uh, places and to meet producers to, to understand uh, the roots of this search. And if we take the example of Corsica, inhabitants are fully aware of the limits of the, uh, of the island uh, production capacity because there's many power cuts to be honest, so some power cuts and uh, <laughs> that reminds them that production is not that easy. So, um, the, some gave this reason to become PV producers, but most of them made a parallel between uh, energy decentralization and political decentralization. So, this point of view has to be understood in the context of the island. In Corsica, tension with the state crystallized around uh, EDF project uh, since the uh, 16th, in the 16th project, to build some power plants and some power lines. Because in France, I, I forgot to say this because it's too obvious in France, but in France, EDF is, is associated to the state. So when EDF decides to, to build something, the state decides to, to build something in people's minds. Or when uh, prices uh, raise, it's EDF that raise prices. Uh, and then actually, if that uh, is not the case, it's a, it's a state decision. So um, uh, for them, in, in this context, uh, becoming producer uh, and getting, gaining some energy uh, autonomy is a way of gaining some uh, Political autonomy, as if you know uh, Corsica, it's a place very particular which has not uh, the same political uh, structure as in the world front. They have some specificities. So, that being said, uh, what do producers mean by autonomy? Producer demand for autonomy is not a request for total self-sufficiency. They do not wish to cut themselves from the grid. 
but to have a freely negotiated relationship with it. For example, using the network as a storage battery or shifting certain uses according to the network, uh, to the power grid's needs, which uh, offer some opportunities for the suppliers to develop some uh, offers in a way that uh, allow to um, manage this uh, intermittent energy, because solar is intermittent, as you know, so it's a little bit difficult for the system. So developing PV on, the, on inhabitant level may be one way to give them a new role in the grid. Producers would become network partners, which is not a political neutral uh, uh, thing, but that's another topic. So if we summarize briefly, um, PV installation uh, is about impact of policy on people's choices, P producers' rational, who are quite different from uh, engineers' rationals, anthropological categorization, anthropology of daily life and daily uses, uh, fantasy about solar energy and quest for autonomy, politics, and so on. So there's a lot of room for anthropologist. So, let me wind down today's presentation by stating that anthropology could have a substantial role in play to play in advancing solar energy development. It allows us to think past stereotypes and to understand uh, people uh, rational behind PV uh, installation or uses of electricity. Producers have a vision. They have a vision of the electric system and of their role in said system. So industrial and public policies could learn from this vision and then develop well and quote projects in day-to-day -day life of local residents, which could be good, which could offer some good opportunities, some job opportunities for young anthropologists. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie Bouli de Lesden, EDF France. I'm sure there are some questions after this interesting speech. Yes. Thank you, Sophie. I was wondering, when you do this research, how does EDF itself take uh, your, your message? You know, do they take account of what you find? How do, the, how do you influence your own organization? Okay, for this topic, they're very interested <laughs> on our results. Um, because, uh, of course, green energy is going to be developed, developed in, in the future and we have to manage energy and energy demand to include uh, solar energy in the grid. So uh, they, they take it into account really, really. If it, uh, your answer. But if they wouldn't, uh, it's their choice, there's a limit. You, you give your conclusion and after, uh, it's it not anymore your job. You're an anthropologist and not a commercial uh, or engineer, you see. Thank you, yes? Thank you, Thank you Sophie. Um, I'm Simone Abram. Um, could you say a little bit more about that in terms of how the, um, your role as a researcher in the organisation, so what happens to the findings of your research? Are you able to publish them or how do you feed them into discussions within the company and beyond the company? So for example, can we read about the research that you're doing? Do you not hear me? No, I don't. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in brief, how do the rest of us get to read about the research that you're doing? Is it published publicly or is it kept within the company? Yes, it's published. Uh, we are researchers, so we're supposed to publish. And uh, of course it's not that uh, evident because uh, sometimes it could be confidential. But most of the time we don't uh, have so much problem with this. 
uh, to be honest, and uh, where uh, uh, the company wants want us to publish and to have a, a good uh, it's a kind of communication and it's a way to have a good partnerships with uh, academics and uh, to build some, uh, some project on a comparative way. So, um, sometimes you, you just have a, a few lives, but I'm sure that it's the same case and as an academic because uh, since you, you leave your PhD period uh, when you're completely focused uh, on your research after you have so much uh, administrative work and uh, also. <laughs> so uh, in, a com in a company like ADF you have very operational project and from this operational project you can learn things and try to to analyze them in an upper way if I could say this and in a more general uh, way to, to more theoretical way so it, it's a job of translation you, you can't stop translate uh, things translate uh, uh, your uh, colleagues demand because your colleagues are, are engineers and they have uh, demands you have to, to translate in an anthropologic way and after uh, you translate again in an operational way and after you publish. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, there in the back. Hi, <laughs> Ben. Um, Hi, Ben. You, okay, I'll pass it down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Um, soyez le bienvenu à Durham. Um, Thanks, Ben. Could you just elaborate on that point about the Corsicans? You mentioned oh. about the political specificities. I was sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but your slide said there was a, um, I think, energy, re, uh, you know, distributed energy versus political decentralization or something of the sort. Um, is there not actually probably some kind of alignment of the political culture of the Corsicans for uh, a sense of energy sovereignty? Uh, actually, I find that this uh, fieldwork was really interesting because the way people used to talk to me about energy why, was the way uh, people talked about the state and about the relationships they, want, they seemed to, to want it with the state. You know that Corsica is not far from uh, mainland France uh, compared to, if we compare to Reunion Island or Guadeloupe, uh, which are departments and which are, uh, don't have the same political uh, status, so it's not a good example. But they're the, 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 the quite close. The, uh, many people don't understand why it's not uh, so easy to have electricity uh, which would not be uh, with fuel, electricity, uh, fuel uh, production because uh, it's still, uh, most of the production in Corsica is still fuels and uh, I don't know if you have ever been there, and there's some power cuts. <laughs> so um, we we really can make a parallel um, uh, with uh, the way they speak uh, of the their relationship with the state. It, it's my point of view, <laughs> but it, it was a, a way of uh, saying we're not the same, but we're part of, and we want to be free and to negotiate our relationship with the state. But in the same time, we don't want to cut from, uh, from the state. That's why I, I said briefly after that uh, uh, producers don't want to cut them from, from the grid, and so from the state, if we uh, make the parallel. Um, it, it's true for um, other territories, but uh, in Corsica, there is this political dim dimension. Which, is cle which clearly appears. When you speak about electricity directly, a way or another, people speak about the state, about political and uh, ecological issues. Because there are many problems in the 16, um, the state decided that they, w they wanted to build a nuclear plant near uh, in the west of the island. And of course, uh, it started being a big struggle. And after there were uh, several, uh, several events like this, and uh, it crystallized 
political opposition against the state for autonomy. Any other question? But yes. it, it, it has a link with Simon's question because I have an article <laughs> on this, which is, is, uh, is printed soon. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a question from the internet, from someone, it's my own. I'd like to seize this chance and uh, ask you, as an expert uh, living and working in France, which is obviously a nuclear, nuclear empire, uh -huh. and I'd like you to reflect <laughs> on how people saw the Fukushima accident, this Fukushima disaster. Did it change or did it affect the, did it affect the public perception of acceptability of nuclear energy? or how the, how the debate evolved and what is the situation now, because we, we all saw that actually in Germany it fueled the transition. Now we really don't want these uh, nuclear plants here anymore. So how did, what happened in, in France in terms of Fukushima story? So uh, how could I um, answer this question? It's a huge question and um, many of my colleagues worked on, on this because uh, we were quite worried <laughs> about how to, to deal with this, uh, this event. Um, nuclear position of French people, uh, position about nuclear is it's quite some, sometimes mixed, but uh, it's clear that we're moving from a more uh, mixed energy production system and uh, because it's a low <laughs> because it's EDF strategy with more and more solar and uh, wind and uh, so on uh, renewable energies and because it uh, offers some uh, commercial issue, uh, opportunities to be honest it's, uh, it's another uh, point but uh, the public opinion about uh, nuclear uh, I'm not sure that I, I can give you a clear answer on this. There was not a big wave like uh, they had in, uh, in, in Germany and with cold. Okay, one more question there. Hi, thanks a lot for your presentation. I had a question about your own position in the, in the company mm -hmm. because uh, in relation to the previous question, your company also produces energy based on these uh, nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether there is internal competition. If you are working on the solar uh, energy and, and now if that becomes really popular, for example, mm -hmm. does this affect your internal relations in any way or? Not at all. <laughs> so <laughs> it, they would be happy. Not at all. No, n nuclear, uh, we can't speak about nuclear and about solar energy <coughs> at EDF, it's not a, it, it's not a problem and uh, uh, no, it, it has no implication. Working for a nuclear, uh, you see n nuclear production in France was decided decades ago, uh, uh, ago uh, and now uh, the company has a problem to, to, to balance uh, growth uh, in energy demand and uh, uh, an increased demand for renewable energies. Uh, so um, we try to work on this way and to, to develop uh, solar or wind e energy. But I don't know if I answer well to your question. Uh, Well, um, if you, uh, I mean, suppose solar energy becomes really popular, mm -hmm. it will go at the expense of other production systems. Yeah, I, I don't know if mm -hmm. I, uh, is, it's not really at that's the not how it looks at. Or other, but, but it's not an anthropological answer, it's not an anthropological point of view, but uh, uh, it's not at the expense of the other nuclear, uh, of the other energy, it's been nuclear, <laughs> because um, uh, energy demand is growing. So if you, if you, st if you stay uh, the nuclear production at the same level anyway, you, you will have to grow uh, other en energy production uh, sources to, you, you know, to answer this demand. Thank you. So I have one more question before we uh, end. 
let's say it's for all those graduates and postgraduates in anthropology who are here in the room and also other graduates in social sciences. How can you make a room or your way in energy in industry? Do you have any trick, any suggestion for the young ones how to uh, open the door in the industry? Oh, to show that we are useful it's great to not, not to be useful all the time because it is great to have not re really useful things. But uh, I really think that anthropology is useful on for for the industry. So uh, and when you you start working for for industry, you, you can uh, meet many people who are really convinced that uh, that it's really uh, the, the new way uh, that they can develop. Uh, and challenge for the energy transition, for the energy demand, and so on. It, it's not that so complicated, to be honest. No. No? So <laughs> when you introduce yourself as an anthropologist, they immediately believe that you're useful. <laughs> <laughs> the position, uh, I, I, I apply to a position which was a position as an anthropologist. So okay. <laughs> They had for an anthropologist. Uh, so EDF anthropologist. had a call for an anthropologist. Yes. yes. How comes? <laughs> I don't know. I will tell you if there are some others. All right. <laughs> uh, so, any other question? I think we're right on time. So, uh, thank you very much, Sophie, once more. <laughs> <laughs>